first letter to the Corinthians. It be the God and Father of our Lord. Chapter 1 and verse 3. Fight the good fight. Timothy chapter 6. Turning now to Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 6 and verse 14. 2 Corinthians, chapter 6, verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And we'll be considering the necessity and the blessings of biblical separation from error, from false teaching, and from worldliness. A briefer title may be When to Stand Apart. And our separation from sin, from the world, from false teaching, wrong teaching about the Lord, runs through both Old Testament and New Testament. It is a major theme of the Old Testament. And you know at once, of course, that one of the great problems of the Jews of old was idolatry, the great call to separation from the nations around and from idolatry. It runs right through the Old Testament and it runs equally right through the New. Separation is vital. Separation is repeatedly and emphatically commanded through the New Testament. Idolatry was a sin of the Jews and the uh, tendency to fail to separate from false teaching and worldliness constantly visits Christian people in New Testament times and since. We are to be a holy people, that is, a set-apart people, a separate people. Be ye holy as I am holy, says the Lord. And that means separate from the world. Not, of course, out of the world and vitally interested in winning souls from the world and very sympathetic toward lost souls and engaging them but not sharing to any degree their sinful culture and their thoughts and their attitudes to life. We're to be quite distinct, quite different. Now there's the principle of separation from error, from false teaching, and separation from the world. And we're going to look at these things in the time before us. And it's, a, it's quite some time since uh, we had a Bible study where we just looked at texts. And this study will be more of that kind of study, looking at texts this evening. And I've uh, gone to lengths to arrange them all in the order in which they appear in the Bible, so that if you're turning with me to them, you won't be going hither and thither, like a, watching a tennis match, but they'll all be one after the other as you go through the books of the Bible. And I'd like to begin here with 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. We apply that, of course, to marriage. That is only one of the applications of the text, and a vital, a most important one. But, of course, the primary sense is that it is addressed to churches, believers in their churches. The Apostle Paul, under inspiration, is addressing a church. He calls it a temple of the Holy Spirit. He uses that uh, kind of terminology in a fairly elastic way. We are as individuals, believers, temples of the Holy Spirit. But a church, a congregation of God's people, is also described by him as a temple of the Holy Spirit. And so he describes the Corinthians here in this very chapter. And uh, in addressing them, he says, be not unequally yoked. What an interesting term that is, yoked. And you all know how animals were yoked together and the law of the Old Testament said that you mustn't uh, put under the yoke 
uh, an ox and an ass. You mustn't be, of course it would be a ridiculous thing to do, to yoke together uh, animals of unequal, unequal kind and pace and size. Then uh, nothing would be drawn, nothing would work properly, and it's used as a figure for union between Christian people and others. You cannot possibly be yoked with unbelievers. Why, who would uh, be the principal mover in that uh, pair under the common yoke? Who would be the principal mover? The unbeliever? The believer? Two animals, you imagine, pulling different ways at different rates. Well, it's impossible. The, the uh, Apostle Paul is illustrating the impossibility of the unequal yoke by an absurdity. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. The gulf is too great. The believer takes quite a different direction from the unbeliever. They're engaged in entirely different missions. One to exploit the carnal things of this world and to go away from God and to live for self and the other to serve him and to win souls for him. Quite different objectives. There can be no common ground in that sense between a believer and an unbeliever. And then the apostle goes on and everything he says is impossible. And he's illustrating the duty of separation from absurd possibilities. For what fellowship, what partnership, what sharing, what cooperation, that's what it means, what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? Righteousness with lawlessness. They don't mix. They have utterly different characteristics. It's unthinkable. Nobody would think for a moment you could mix righteousness with lawlessness. You could combine the two. It is absurd. And so it is absurd, the Apostle says, for the believer to share in common labor and uh, aims with an unbeliever. He's talking, of course, about worship and spiritual service, spiritual things. And yet, we have denominations in this country that have abandoned the gospel and gone from bad to worse, where the majority of people in those denominations do not believe the truths of the Bible, the uh, in evangelical conversion and all the things the believer holds dear, and yet believers are in those denominations and cooperating and working. They're rebels to some extent, but they're still cooperating in many respects. The apostle is saying, this is impossible. This cannot be. It's, it's as absurd as mixing righteousness with unrighteousness. And he goes on in verse 14, what communion what partnership, an even stronger word, what sharing, hath light with darkness. You cannot mix the two and have one or the other. If light enters darkness, it's no longer dark. If shade enters light, well then it's ruined and darkened. He's arguing uh, using impossible situations. What communion hath light with darkness? The possibility of believers sharing in worship and in spiritual ministry with unbelievers is impossible and absurd, he says. And it is. And verse 15, what concord, what agreement hath Christ with Belial? Christ and Satan. Now Belial can refer to a particular heathen god, but largely used here, it obviously refers to Satan. What concord, agreement hath Christ with the devil? None. It is impossible. And yet the devil's agents are false teachers who undermine the gospel and oppose it and ridicule the Bible and criticize it. And you can't work with those people. It's impossible. Verse 16. And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? Now this verse gives those who wish to work with or to be identified with unbelievers some uh, excuse to justify themselves. Oh, they say, the apostle is only talking about 
idol worshippers. He's not talking about people being in the same denomination as Christians, even if they're only nominal Christians, who reject the Bible and do not believe in the shed blood of Christ as an atoning substitutionary death. They're still not idolaters. They still acknowledge God, the true God, to some extent. Even Catholics believe in in the Trinity and believe in some of the basic things that the Bible teaches. It's not talking about them. You can hold discussions with them. You can talk about ecumenical alliance with them or with high churchmen in the Church of England. What this is talking about is idolaters. Now they are infidels and they're beyond the pale. But that's absurd. The apostle isn't only talking about idolatry. In fact, he's using idolatry as an extreme example of his position because throughout he uses terms which he commonly uses to describe all unbelievers, such as the term unbeliever. Verse 14, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And that term is used constantly by the apostle and throughout the New Testament, not just for idolaters, but for all unbelievers. What fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? People who are obedient to God's law and people who are not. And what communion hath light with darkness? There's no common ground. Throughout this whole passage, well, the apostle is, uh, you could sprinkle exclamation marks throughout He's producing examples which force us to say, no, that cannot possibly be. Verse 16 again, what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? It's an example of union of Christian people, evangelical people, with those even who claim to be Christians, but who reject the evangelical gospel. For ye are the temple of the living God, and that's an exclusive temple. There is one God. Yes, a trinity, but one God. And uh, he exclusively possesses his people. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. He will not share from anyone with anyone. So there comes the great call in verse 17. Wherefore come out from among them and be ye separate saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and so on. We'll look at some of these great verses. Verse 16 quotes from Leviticus, chapter 26, and also from Ezekiel, chapter 27. And then verse 17 is a kind of, uh, uh, well, it's not a direct quotation, but it's based upon Isaiah 52, verses 11 and 12, and I'll read them to you because they're so important to understand the passage. Depart ye, depart ye, go ye out from thence, touch no unclean thing, go ye out of the midst of her, be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. And then Isaiah goes on, for ye shall not go out with haste, nor go by flight, for the Lord will go before you, and the God of Israel will be your rearward. And so it was a prophecy of how the Israelites, the remnant, would be released from Babylon, and there would be those who would go back to Jerusalem, and they were to take nothing of Babylon with them. None of its features none of its characteristic delights. They were to make a complete break. And incidentally, this uh, verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 17, it applies not only from coming out from any union with, on, for religious purposes with people who do not share the truth, but it speaks about coming out from the world too, just as the remnant came out of Babylon and they were not to touch anything unclean or bring any of its characteristics with them, so we have no fellowship with those who deny the faith and we leave the world 
in the sense that we do not adopt any of its distinctively sinful culture. And then comes the promise of God, I will receive you and will be a father unto you and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. And in chapter 7, verse 1, the exhortation, having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. And you see two of the great uh, themes of separation there. Separation from false teaching, from all kinds of idolatry and falsehood, and separation from the sinful aspects of worldliness. And only when we come away from those can we really receive the great blessing of Almighty God. So, uh, just a glance at some of the words before we move on, because look at verse 14 again. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. You cannot be a member of a church or a denomination where there is antagonism to the gospel. You cannot share with it. You cannot do that. That's an emphatic command. You cannot have communion as light with darkness. You have nothing in common. You cannot have agreement uh, any more than Christ can have agreement with Satan. And at the end of verse 15, or what part, what portion hath he that believeth with an infidel? You have a portion. And the infidel, the unbeliever, has a portion too in life. He has, you may say, chosen his portion, and you've chosen your portion. Your distinctive blessings, your possessions of knowledge and spiritual life. You cannot share them with an unbeliever. You can share the gospel, but you cannot share your salvation, your spiritual possession. And nor can he share his disobedience to God with you. You can witness, you can pray, you can sympathize, but you have different portions. And that's the argument of the Apostle Paul in this passage. So that's where we start, the basis of biblical separation. Now I'm turning on, I'm going to do this rapidly, to Galatians chapter 1 and verses 8 and 9, where the Apostle says to the Galatian believers, but though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. You will have nothing to do with him. Anyone who preaches a distortion of the gospel, you won't be ordained by him, you won't share his denomination, you won't recognize him, support him, cooperate with him, let him be accursed. And then in verse 9, As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. And I can just go over to uh, uh, Galatians chapter 5 and verse 12, where we read simply these words, I would, says the Apostle Paul, they were even cut off, which trouble you. The false teachers, the people who deny the truth, we're to have nothing to do with them. Now, these commands are authoritative. They're obligatory. They're imperative, emphatic, insistent. They're gigantic commands, fundamental and important. And that takes me to second Thessalonians and chapter 3 and in verse 6 we read these words now we command you brethren in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly and not after the tradition which he received of us now that's serious that applies first of all obviously to people who would be teaching something other than the truth. Once again, 
And it surely applies to people who don't obey that command. So if there is somebody who is a believer in the gospel, but he disobeys the Lord, and he does fellowship with unbelievers, and he does cooperate with unbelievers in some denomination, and recognize them, and so on, then he too should be avoided. We can't really work with him. He's in a state of considerable disobedience to the Lord. And this passage would address that. We command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye you withdraw yourselves, that you stand apart from every brother, it's believers we're talking about, that walketh disorderly, not just by refusing to work, which is also in the chapter, and so on, but walking disorderly, not according to the apostolic instructions, and not after the tradition which he received of us, which includes separation from false teaching. If a person refuses to do that, then he himself is to be withdrawn from. And we'll go into that in just a moment. And uh, we could read verse 14 of the chapter. And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him that he may be ashamed. This man is a believer. Yet we're to have no company with him. Verse 15, yet count him not as an enemy of the gospel and of, your, of yourselves, because he is actually a believer. But admonish him as a brother. And while we admonish him as a brother and we remonstrate with him and we try to persuade him and we recognize that he's a believer, yet we're to have no company with him if he disobeys the apostolic instructions. And this is a most emphatic instruction and command that we do not have partnership with unbelievers or opponents of the gospel. That means if a person is working with unbelievers in his denomination and he won't obey the Lord in that matter, we can't work with him either. We can recognize him as a believer, but we can't fellowship with him to the point of working with him. We can remonstrate. Now, this is a complicated issue because I was, as I was mentioning some weeks ago, there are different grades of offender. It may be that there is a minister, an evangelical minister, and he is headlong in his denomination and very ecumenical and he's cooperating with the false teachers and recognizing them. Well, we may say he's a believer and he does some good things and we're, we can be glad of that, but we can't work with him because he disobeys the Lord. But then there might be a similar person working his de in his denomination who takes a different attitude and he himself is not very cooperative with his denomination and he does not relate to the unbelievers in that denomination. Might be a strange position he's in, but he fights his corner and keeps himself apart. Even though he's very unwise, he's still in that apostate denomination, but he keeps himself apart from the false teachers and he tries to uphold the truth. Now that's, he's still not obedient to the apostolic instructions, but he's nothing like as disobedient as the person who's full tilt into that denomination, even as a believer. So obviously, we might be a lot more charitable towards him. We might have quite good fellowship with him even. We might, he might be persuadable by us. We may win him over to a more logical position to come out altogether. But if he's a rebel within that denomination and he's not of those false teachers or mixing with those false teachers, we'd have a lot more in common with him. 
but probably we wouldn't ask him to uh, occupy our pulpit and share things with him because that would be uh, too close for somebody who hasn't actually faced up to the commands of the Lord. So there are degrees of offender in this, and we do note that. So we wish to be fair and to be careful in these matters. But I point you to that particular text. And then I'm going on to 1 Timothy and chapter 6. And uh, I'll read verse 3. If any man teach otherwise, there's been a long list of apostolic instructions, and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. This is back to the unbeliever now. He is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, and so on, the end of verse 5, from such withdraw thyself. So here's a case of people who engage with us, and they appear to be operating within a church, and they love to debate and argue, but they're destitute of the truth, and it's all to no profit, and if we remonstrate with them or talk to them or witness to them, they just want to turn it into a sort of wrangling debate. They're not touchable. We withdraw ourselves from them. That again is the command to evangelical Bible-believing people in denominations. They can't get anywhere with those liberals. Then they should withdraw from them. With those Anglo-Catholics and all the others, the command is they should withdraw from. This is such a constantly repeated command in the New Testament. Second Timothy chapter 2 and I go down to verse 16. Shun profane and vain babblings for they will increase unto more ungodliness. And this is in the church if you please. It has to be shunned. And verse 19, nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Now this is talking about the professing church. Look at verse 20. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth and some to honour and some to dishonour. In the professing church, the people who claim to be Christians, there are vessels unto honour and vessels unto dishonour. There are those of gold and silver, the saved people, and those of ignoble materials. Verse 21, If a man therefore purge himself from these, the latter, the vessels made to dishonour, he shall be a vessel unto honour, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work, but only by purging himself from those that are not uh, Bible believers and upholding the doctrines of the faith truly. And that's the instruction in that passage. And Second Timothy, again, chapter 3 and verse 5. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. They don't believe in evangelical conversion. A new life, well, we cannot walk with them, have spiritual fellowship with them, recognize them. Obviously we can witness, we can remonstrate, but we cannot partnership with them and we shouldn't be in that same group of churches. So these are some of the commands. I could go on quickly to Titus chapter 3 and verse 10. And uh, a man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition reject. Now the Greek word translated heretic is literally a schismatic. And that means uh, really somebody who chooses for himself. Somebody who chooses for himself what he believes, where he stands. 
He, the word of God is not his authority. He isn't subservient, obedient, subject to the word of God and its teaching. He makes his own doctrines up. He decides for himself how much of the word of God, if any, he'll believe. He's a liberal theologian, or he's an Anglo-Catholic, or something like that. He chooses for himself what his faith will look like. You cannot work with him. You cannot be in the same uh, denomination with him if he's the majority of people in that group. That's impossible. Now I turn just to one or two more texts and we'll focus on the world. First John chapter 4 and verse 1. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Now that's just to introduce the teaching of John in 1 John, where to be a people who examine where people really stand. And I'm just going on, for, we'll come back to 1 John in a moment, to 2 John uh, and chapters 7, and uh, sorry, verses 7 and 11. So 2 John, one chapter book, verse 7, for many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. And then, uh, verse 9, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. And then in verse 10, If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house. Neither bid him God speed, for he that biddeth him God speed is partaker of his evil deeds. So let us suppose that this applies, this passage, to a teacher of the Christian church. That's what seems to be in view. He is a traveling teacher, preacher, and he comes to your house. He's not a, an ordinary unbeliever a neighbor from the street. He's somebody who pretends to be a teacher of the truth. Verse 10, if there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, the doctrine of Christ, don't even let him into your house, let alone into your church. Somebody's a Bible believer in the Church of England and allows a most ungodly, uh, modernistic bishop come in to lay hands upon the confirmation candidates and to preach and to speak well the apostle John under inspiration says receive him not into your house and if not into your house certainly not into your church neither bid him God speed don't wish him a blessing on his labors in the name of the Lord you mustn't do it it's a command of scripture now, some people who are uh, compromised in denominations, they have a way of getting out of this command. And if you were to take up the late Dr. John Stott's commentary on the epistles of John and look up what he says on this passage, this is how they get out of it. And, of course, he entered into dialogue with Rome, John Stott, he cooperated with his denomination fully and intimately. So what does he make of a passage like this when he writes his commentary on it? Well, he focuses back on the earlier verse that I read to you, verse 7. For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Oh, he says, that's what the passage is all about. This only applies to a person who denies the incarnation of Christ. If he denies the incarnation of Christ, then don't let him into your house or into your church. As long as he believes in the incarnation of Christ, he's okay. He could be a Roman Catholic. He believes in the incarnation of Christ. He can be most uh, liberal theologians who believe that Christ is uh, somehow related to the divine, even if they don't believe it fully. They claim to believe in some measure in the incarnation of the Son of God. So as long as they believe that one thing, you don't have to obey this command. But the Apostle John 
doesn't only mention the incarnation, he mentions the doctrine of Christ. In other words, exactly who he was and everything he taught. You've got to believe in Christ. And if you're a teacher who rejects that Christ is the Son of God who suffered a, an atoning substitutionary death on Calvary, who is the redeemer of the world, if you deny any of the essential doctrines of Christ, then we cannot warmly relate to you. You are an enemy of the gospel, says the Apostle John. So they duck and weave, and they try to get out of these commands, but it's impossible. They're very plain. They're very direct. This is somebody who denies Christ and his offices and his work and evangelical conversion and anybody who says God bless you in your work the Bible tells us has made himself a sharer of his evil deeds and an encourager of him and that's what happens that's why I keep saying this type of thing whole denominations have collapsed into the arms of the devil and become apostate all these things have happened because people who should have known better, Bible believers, mixed with false teachers, supported them, greeted them, warmly recognized them, when the Bible said we mustn't do that. Well, we certainly remonstrate with them and plead with them if they'll listen and we get opportunity, but we cannot be participants with them in the same denomination. And that means it's a very serious thing for Christians to disobey that command. Oh, but we say we know Bible believers in doctrinally decadent denominations who preach the truth and know some measure of blessing. Well, we will, because that is the kindness of God and the mercy of God but they should still heed his commands. They should still leave those things. Even the rebel within, who we admire much more, is still in a very illogical and unwise position, remaining in that completely compromised anti-gospel group of churches. Now I'd like to speak very briefly about separation from the world. And I'm going back to the Gospel of John, and then we have a similar sequence, but much, much quicker. And in the Gospel of John, chapter 15 and verse 19, the Lord Jesus Christ says, If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. That's our foundation. The clear teaching of Christ is that there is always a barrier between the Christian and the worldling. Though we're so sympathetic and we're dedicated lifelong as churches to try to win people out of the world and to pray them out as we were once won out of the world, yet there is a barrier between us. We cannot share the sinful aspects of worldly culture. Chapter 17 and the Lord Jesus Christ makes it plain here in two verses. John chapter 17 and verse 6. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. And then I read straight on to save time to verse 14. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. And again in verse 16, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. And yet, astonishingly, we've got worldly culture now taken up by Bible-believing churches. That is so astonishing. I turn quickly to Romans chapter 12, verses 1 to 2, but I must come to the more specific verses. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, 
acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. It's an enormous gulf between the world and the church, and so there should be. And then in Romans 16 and verse 17, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions, parties, and offences. And the Greek word is scandals, but I'll tell you what it meant in the Greek. Though mark them which cause scandals, offences, contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, the apostolic rules, and avoid them. Avoid them. Well, what are these scandals? Well, they are literally, that's what the Greek word meant originally, traps, stumbling blocks. People who introduce stumbling blocks, which will trip people up and bring them down. Today, that will include people who bring worldliness into churches. Pop music so that young people don't know anymore what is worldliness and what is of the Lord. And they make a trap and a stumbling block. And they ruin the lives of the young who've got no way of measuring anymore what's right and what's wrong. And maintaining separation from the world because the church is doing worldly things and imitating the world even in worship. That's a scandal. It's a stumbling block. It's a trap. You can't relate to those kind of Christians. They're Bible believers, they may be saved, you can remonstrate with them, but what they're doing is immensely harmful and damaging, and it's contrary to God's word, and they're bringing in stumbling blocks, and uh, causing no end of disaster and trouble, and causing people to fall. And then I read very quickly Galatians chapter 1 and verse 4, and... I must begin to move to conclusion. Who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world. It's a present evil world. I could take you to Ephesians 5, 11, 7 and 4 and so on. And James 4, of course. I can't go through all the verses now because I'm out of time. But James 4, 4. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, using these terms not literally, but speaking of spiritual adultery. Know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. We've got so many friends of the world in evangelical churches, bringing it in wholesale. And they've made themselves enemies of God. We can't work with them. We can't relate to them. It's awful what is going on. It's uh, absolutely shocking. I could turn to First Peter chapter 1 and verse 13. Wherefore gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ as obedient children. And then... The passage goes on, but as he which hath called you is holy, meaning separate, apart, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, meaning behavior and citizenship. You are a different people. Be ye holy, for I am holy. And then First John chapter 2, you know where I'm going. I'm sure these great world words, love not the world, verse 15, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. He may be a Christian, but he's fallen a long way to love the world. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And then in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 4, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. 
I cannot read more text because it's taking up our last moments. I was reading one person, preacher, very well known, who believes in uh, entering into worldly culture, taking it up as Christian people, using it. And he justifies it in this way. He says, oh, you cannot understand unbelievers if you do not explore and share their distinctive culture and the way they do things. You can't understand them, he says. You've got to know how to talk to them. And you cannot talk to them or know how to talk to them without being on the front line and being involved. So you do what worldlings do and you attend their characteristic places of entertainment and share in their culture and their sinful culture. And this is the great justification. But of course, it's a phony argument Practically everybody goes out to work. We mix with unbelievers constantly. Now I know there are some places in the United States where it's possible for a person to be brought up in a Christian home, go to a Christian school or be homeschooled, go to a Christian college, go to a Christian church, perhaps work in a Christian place of employment and never meet an unbeliever. But I think actually that's unlikely. But for most of us, we don't need to engage in worldly culture in order to understand worldlings. In any case, you go to places of uh, entertainment, worldly places of entertainment. What witnessing are you doing there? We had a brother here, a good brother, and uh, he went to clubs to witness and uh, because he used to go clubbing and he thought he wanted to win the clubbers so he went to clubs he didn't do what they did he wasn't compromising himself in that sense but I tell you what did happen to him night after night he got thrown out <laughs> if you really are witnessing in worldly places of amusement you won't be there for long somebody will be against you somebody will shut you up what opportunity do you get anyway? Can, can you imagine? You go to all the Christian, all not Christian, worldly ball games, all the worldly theatres, all the, you're all gawping at the same entertainment which is providing. That's not a place for witness. This is a phony argument. You've got to be in the world to understand the world. You're rubbing shoulders with the world all the time. And the argument goes on. You've got to be in the world to know what the world's needs are and how to address the worldly. But the Bible tells us that. We are reproducing a given message, something we are given. We are educated from the word. And most of us have been worldlings at some time in our lives and been deeply immersed in worldly surroundings. All this is a phony argument. The plain fact is that the person who makes these arguments is renowned for having the loudest worldly music in his church and churches that can be found anywhere. They're up to their necks in worldly culture. And what is worldly culture? This is really another message. But worldly culture is uh, uh, anti-God. It's um, anti-morals. It's anti-authority. It's self, self, self. It's self-indulgent. It's everything which is the opposite of the Christian lifestyle. It's nothing to do with us. Of course it is. It reflects the world's tastes and desires. Now, I know there is worldly culture which is relatively innocent, and there is worldly music which is relatively innocent, and you can certainly engage in those things, but the things which are being adapted and borrowed by churches are right out of the worst of worldly culture. And it's so absurd, dear friends, and it's ruining churches, it's ruining worship. I ask you, you hear some of the modern singers, and they're warbling, 
and they're engaging in styles of song and voice presentation which are totally artificial, emotional manipulation, seductive and so on, or heavily, crazily, rhythmic with crashing chords, which again is just emotional manipulation. And they've borrowed it all from the world and there's nothing sincere and straight about it at all. And worship is becoming like that. And congregations are learning to sing like that. And the musical forms are those that have been invented by people who are promoting an anti-God, anti-moral culture. It is a direct contravention of everything we read in the Word of God, and it's outrageous. It is sinful. Much of the modern, the contemporary Christian music is actually sinful to adapt things like that from the world. It's an outrage. It's against all these scriptures, all these texts. We're to have our own distinctive sacred culture which accords with the word of God and its standards and has nothing to do with those things. You remember the old catchphrase of the Canadian philosopher, sociologist, which he invented in... The 1960s, I think 1968 is the date usually given to it. The medium is the message. I think everybody knows that. And it's true that the message, the medium rather, embeds itself in the message and distorts it. So here's the preacher, and he's preaching about Christ. He's sound. He's preaching about the atonement. He's preaching about the need for repentance and yielding to Christ and trusting in him alone. But at the same time, alongside his preaching, what's going on on the platform is very scantily, seductively dressed people, boys and girls, dancing around in a totally worldly way and songs and rhythms and music and everything which is an exact replica of what goes on in the world. The medium embeds itself on the message. And what the hearer hears is this. Oh, I can come to Christ and trust in him and he will have died for me and I can go to heaven and have the world and change relatively nothing in my life. So the message has been twisted and bent and altered and compromised by the medium. And even a worldly sociologist could see that years ago. And Christian people amazingly are not ready to see that because they want to compromise. Why? Well, that's another subject. Why do they want to compromise? Is it lack of faith? Don't they trust the power of the gospel anymore? Don't they trust the power of the Holy Spirit anymore? Don't they trust the instructions of the word anymore? It's a question of trust. Or is it a question of taste? It's what they like. Is that possible? That there are even pastors and church leaders who still have the world in their hearts and they rather like to bring the world into these things. Why? Well, I can't entirely answer that friends but what goes on today is anti-scriptural and terrible and you know it promotes a number of things I mentioned this earlier it confuses the hearer young people don't know about separation from the world anymore and churches become increasingly unhallowed and godless places serious Christians learn to have a pick and choose type of trust in the word of God. They see these commands in the scripture and they see their preachers disobeying them and their churches disobeying them. And so they say to themselves, oh, I got it all wrong. I thought you had to do exactly what the scripture says. But now I get it. You don't have to be terribly meticulous or conscientious you can pick and choose a bit because the scripture says this, this and this and my church doesn't do that. It ignores that. 
it finds way, ways around all these things. So I can be rather more relaxed about my obedience to scripture and just pick and choose. And that's the spirit it brings in. And that's the spirit it has brought in. And I find constantly that if I try to remonstrate with somebody, be a pastor or a Christian, you know, you shouldn't be doing that. They're, they're not interested. Oh, that's just your point of view. This is the way we do it. The scripture is no longer the absolute authority. They're not convicted if you point to scripture. They're not concerned. You see what all this brings in? Undermining the authority of God's word, the holiness and godliness of the church and of the people. It's an awful thing. It's a terrible thing that is going on. But I didn't want to plunge you all into gloom this evening, friends. We want to bring as many people back as possible to the promise of scripture to those good old texts in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, especially the end of the chapter, the promise of God that he will be with us if we stand clear of all these wrong practices and wrong things. And I must close there.